Greetings, everybody. I don't know if it's cool where you're at. It's cool here, but it's May. And I think that means great things are coming because great weather is going to happen. And I hope that as the weather warms up, your heart is getting warmer for the Lord and your love for him is getting, getting stronger. And you just feel his presence. Because I think God is doing something wonderful in our midst right now in, in all this. So I hope things are going well for you. I have with me, you see this says, a stick. Now, I don't want you to think of it as just a stick, but think of it as a shepherd's staff, okay? A shepherd's staff, because what I want to talk to you about now is we talk about the God of the valleys. Are you ready for this? This is the, the God of the valley of deep shadow. Okay, the God of the valley of deep shadow. It's going to be probably a little bit different uh, translation than what you're used to as we look at Psalms 23 this morning. <clears throat> Let me read it. This is from the NIV. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. <clears throat> he guides me along the path that's right for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the deep, darkest valley... I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me on the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, all of David's psalms were written from a certain perspective and context. And, and there, there's, a, there's a belief, anyway, that David wrote this psalm from the context of when his son Absalom rebelled against him. There's a couple of them that say that. At that moment, uh, his son Absalom had killed a lot of his sons, and he was marching into Jerusalem with an army set to kill David and to make himself king of Israel. So instead of fighting his son, David flees to the wilderness with a few friends and a few servants. And there he probably penned this, this psalm where it says, The Lord is my shepherd. He is in a valley of deep shadow. We'll talk more about that translation when we get to verse 4. Uh, but there in the midst of David's pain, he, and realizing that his son wants to kill him, David is saying, I know God is with me and he's leading me. God is here. I don't know what he's up to, but God is here. And we need to remember that in the midst of our confusion, our struggle, in the midst of our deep, dark valley, that God is there even when we don't know what he's doing. That is what we call faith. Trusting God even when we don't know what's going on. And so we need to remember, in the midst of our confusion, in the midst of our struggle, God is there and he's working. It's interesting that, that the first line, after he says, Lord, I'm a shepherd, he says, I lack nothing. An amazing statement considering you know, what's going on in David's life. In this probable context of Psalm 23, David has temporarily lost his kingdom. His son has moved into the palace. And he's committing adultery with David's concubines. And that's a way of saying, it's, it's like slapping David in the face. When he's saying, I am now the king, I'm taking, and I'm taking my liberties here, and I don't care. It's as if my dad was dead. And in the midst of all that, David says, I lack nothing. God will take care of me, and God will take care of my needs. Paul reflects something like that in Philippians 4.19. He says, and my God will meet all of your needs according to his glorious riches, in Christ Jesus. Paul had been thanking the church for its provisions for him, and now he tells them God will supply what is necessary. It's basically what the translation reads, what is necessary for each of us. And when David says, I lack nothing, he's saying the similar thing. God will care for us. God will supply us for us. God knows what we need. And, and God is always there taking care of us, even when it seems like we don't know where he's at. In the 1990s, there was a, a teacher by the name of Jeff Leland, we see this terrible news that his, his little boy had cancer. And his boy's name was Michael. He needed a bone marrow transplant. And, and the good news was that Michael's six-year-old sister was a perfect match. But Jeff's insurance company wouldn't pay for it. He just moved to, to her, his new home, just moved uh, to a new school, and they wouldn't pay for a bone marrow transplant until he'd been there a year, and he hadn't been. So they didn't know what to do. So what happened was, as, as the year went along, Michael's urgent need for a bone marrow transplant got worse, and he would probably die if he didn't have it. And at that point, they needed $200,000 for 
for a bone marrow transplant, and I needed it by, by the end of May, and this was like the beginning of May. Well, another teacher by the name of Joe told his class about the situation of Jeff Leland. And there was a little boy in there named, named Damien. He was a seventh grader. He walked with a limp. He struggled in special education classes, but he made a visit to, to uh, Mr. Leland's house. He said, Mr. Leland, don't make a big deal out of this, but if your baby's in trouble, I want to help. And he reached into his pocket and pulled out 12 $5 bills. It was his entire life savings. He says, here, this is to help Michael get better. Well, word got about Damien's gift, and some kids in his school started a walkathon. Others began to hold car washes. Junior high kids just had this wave of compassion went out. After a week, D Damien's gift had multiplied it. And at the end of that week, a man walked into one of the local banks and handed a check for $10,000 for Michael's fund. And Michael's fund had grown to $16,000. TV stations in, in the big city right there picked up the story. By the end of May, Michael's fund had grown to $62,000. Not what they needed, but the, but the uh, hospital said, look, we'll move the transplant back two weeks. On June 5th, they had $143,000. By 8th, they had $160,000. By the 9th, they had $185,000. And in just four and a half weeks, Damien's gift had gone from $60 to $220,000. Michael got the bone marrow transplant. Damien grew close to the family. Uh, Michael's family were Christians, and Damien grew to know Jesus Christ as his Savior. And here, here Damien was an unlikely hero. He gave this all so another boy could live. And so you never know what God is doing in the midst of of your valley of deep shadow. You just never know. God's at work, not only in your life, but in the life of others. And he knows exactly what you need, exactly when you need it. The next part of that line, uh, David says, He makes me to lie down on green pastures and leads me beside quiet waters. As we walk through this psalm, you know, he's trying to tell us you know, things about sheep that he knows, because David was a shepherd. He says, you know, sheep only lie down in places that are fertile and green. In fact, sheep will eat in places where the grass is really fertile. And, and sheep really depend on the shepherd. They're helpless, really, without a shepherd. And the sheep will only lie down if they have plenty to eat, their thirst has been quenched, and they no longer feel threatened. But the shepherd can't force the sheep to lie down. So uh, the Hebrew in this translation really leads that he, gives, he makes them settle down rather than forces them to lie down. So he makes the sheep settle down. So the shepherd knows how to calm the fears, calm the needs, help the sheep to feel safe and secure so they'll lie down and sleep. So here's David in a, in a heart of a deep, dark valley. And it literally can be translated death, dark valley. And God, he says, has provided safety, security, exactly what I need right now because he's my shepherd and he's making me settle my heart down, settle my emotions down and relax. He says the same thing to you and I. God provides you security. God provides you safety. God knows the depths of your struggle in your deep, dark valley and will help us settle down in Him. If we trust Him, if we follow Him, if we listen to Him. Then David says this thing in verse 3, He refreshes my soul. He guides me along right paths for His name's sake. I like that. God refreshes our soul. Again, the literal reading of Hebrew is He returns my breath. Or returns my soul to me. The idea is we've been feeling lost and lonely and weak and frightened, and God just makes us go, ah, relax. So in the in the death dark valley of emotion, in the valley of deep shadow that we're struggling in, God provides exactly emotionally what we need in that moment too. And you see, God seeks to refresh you. God seeks to restore you. God reveals to you that you're not alone, and whatever you're, at, I am with you. You need to follow his word. You need to talk to him in prayer. You need to worship him. You need to honor him with your life. And he says, you know what? He refreshes me here. He refreshes my emotion. He refreshes my soul. He gives me a breath back in my life to go, ah. And that brings us to verse 4, where we talk about the valley of deep shadow. He says in verse 4, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear me, evil, for you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And this darkest valley literally is death, dark valley. It can be translated death shadow or deep shadow. And so the idea is this, this death, dark valley you go through. And, and, and in Israel, there's, there's these very deep crevices there that may only have a path 
and maybe three or four or five feet wide. In fact, there's a place, a place called Petra in Jordan. It's called a Sikh at Petra. You can wander through this place. You can go back and find a beautiful church carved into the rock. And so you were forced, because of the, of the path, to walk through this winding, curvy valley that may only be five or six, ten feet wide. Uh, that would be very dark. And even in the middle of the day, unless the sun straight overhead. So it's very scary because robbers would hide behind the curves and, and things. And they might jump out and, 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 and I rob you, but they might actually kill you. People were scared to do that. But there was no other path to go through. You had to go through this if you want to get from one place to another. And so you're in this death, dark valley. And fear springs up in us, right? We're afraid. I don't know what's going to happen. Am I going to make it? Am I not going to make it? And so the, the victory only lies on the other side of the death, dark valley. It's like, ah, what am I going to do? But David says, look, even though I walk through this darkest valley, I don't fear evil. You know why? You're with me, O oh Lord. Your rod and your staff, they bring comfort to me. The rod and the staff, that's why I have this. The rod and the staff, first of all, we used to protect the sheep, right? The shepherd could use this to fend off wolves or anybody's going to try to steal the sheep away. And they were used to guide the sheep. He could reach out and kind of poke the sheep on one side or the other, kind of steer the lead sheep down the way the lead sheep should go. And he might use it to discipline. He might strike the sheep if they were getting out of line because, you know, sheep follow other sheep and one got out of line, all of them got out of line. In fact, there's a story told of a lady who was, who was in, in the mountain places out, out in Europe. And she'd come upon a shepherd. He was lying by the sheep at a broken leg. And she asked the shepherd, she said, oh, man, what happened? She said, he said, well, the shepherd said, I broke its leg. And she said, well, why? He said, because this sheep was straying all the time. It was leading other sheep away into places that were dangerous. There were wolves, there were cliffs. He said, I tried many ways, and finally he said, I just broke its leg. to make it stop. Oh, she said, why? He said, well, I didn't want it to lead other sheep astray. And when I first came to it afterwards, he said, I went to... To feed it, tried to bite me. But I left it alone for a couple days. And the next time it came to feed it water, it licked my hand. And, and, and it took food freely. And when it heals, it'll be the most faithful sheep in the fold. It'll come as soon as it hears my voice. It won't stray from the flock. It's going to go straight where it should go. He said, so I broke its leg to make it learn obedience. To make it learn that it has to listen to my voice to be safe. And so sometimes God in his discipline uses the rod... To correct us, to keep us from hurting ourselves or others. Now he's in a place in the scripture where he says he makes them to pass under the rod. Now what would happen is the shepherd would put the rod over the entrance to the sheep's gate, and as the sheep would go in, he'd look at them. He'd, he'd, he'd see, do they have any bugs on them? Do they have any wounds on them? You know, are, are, are they sick? And he would examine each sheep as they passed under the rod to make sure it's free from hurt and pain and free from sickness and disease. And, you know, it is about examining and sense. Us, God examines our hearts and our motives and our lifestyles when we pass under his rod to say, are you okay? Are you hurting? And, and, and so in this death, dark valley David's going through, he's saying, look, God is, is examining me. He's seeing me. He's saying, look, I'm with you. I'm, I'm guiding you. I'm steering you. And I'm making you kind of pass under my rod to make sure you're okay. God will supply what is necessary. David says, God will settle your heart. God will refresh and restore you. God says, you don't need to be afraid. I'm with you. And he protects us. I like these scriptures. Psalms 116.6 The Lord protects the simple hearted. When I was in great need, he saved me. Psalms 37, 28 and 29 The Lord loves the just. He will not forsake his faithful ones. They'll be protected forever. But the offspring of the wicked, he will cut off. So it's very amazing what God, God does, isn't it? And then he says, he anoints my head with oil. I like that idea, anointing our heads with oil. Because that's telling us that God, that God begins to cleanse us and wash away the junk in our lives, right? Verse 5, he begins to tell us about this awesome blessings that he's given. We trust him through the deep, dark valley. We walk with him through the deep, dark valley. He says, look, verse 5, you prepare a table before me, the princes of my enemies. And you anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Let's touch on this in a minute. This, this is really cool. Because David says, once I got the deep dark valley, I experienced the blessings of God that are amazing. 
in the Middle East, a gesture of hospitality would happen when you invited somebody into your house and you shared your table with them, you shared your food with them. Um, they showed how valuable a person was or how valuable I am, not by what I own, but how big of a table I could set before you. And, and here David says the host at this great table is God himself. And he's prepared this wonderful banquet for me in the very presence of those who have hurt me and wounded me. And he, she's honoring me with this because that's how you honor somebody is with this great banquet, right? You honor them with that. And he's showing that I have this, I'm in community with him. I have the power of a relationship with my God because he is the host and he's hosting me, just this little, this little king, really. A shepherd boy. And he's showing how much he's honoring me by inviting me to this table because I've lived my life in faith in him, because I've trusted him through the death dark valley. And, and, and then he says, you anoint my head with oil. Uh, oil was used for, for healing wounds. It's poured on somebody to heal wounds. It was poured on as an act of honoring. Kings were even anointed with that when they were uh, going to be coronated. So David says, look, God poured this oil on me to heal me from the wounds of this pain I've gone through with my son. And God is honoring me through this. God's healing me, and God's honoring me. See, when we trust God in the death dark valley, he treats our wounds and he honors us. We're getting this extraordinary loving treatment from our Father in heaven. That's a blessing because we've walked with him through the death dark valley because we trust him to be with us, to protect us with his rod and staff. And we say, God, I know you're with me. I don't know what's going on, but you're with me. Then David says this in verse 6. Surely your goodness and your mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of my Lord forever. David discovers after I walk through the death, death dark valley, after I trust him, I'm no longer surrounded by evil. I'm no longer surrounded by this, this horrible thing. God is there. I've got God's goodness and God's covenant love right here. The word for love is an amazing word here. It's a very important word in Hebrew. The word is chesed in Hebrew. And it's got a whole long list of meanings. Meanings like mercy and love and kindness and faithfulness and loyalty and compassion and grace. And so David says, look, I discovered not only God's goodness, but God's faithful, loving grace that was established in when I became in relationship with him. It's, a, it's an astounding mercy he's shown me because of this relationship that I have. Because I've agreed to, to follow him in a relationship. We're in a covenant relationship. So I'm no longer surrounded by evil. I, I like this. I hope you can read it. It says this. No longer surrounded by evil and faithful through the dark, death dark valley. David says, I'm more aware of being swept up in the goodness and the great, loving, gracious relationship with my God. That is so cool, isn't it? He says, I am much more aware I've been swept up in this loving, gracious relationship with my Father in heaven because I was faithful and I held on through the death dark valley. I discovered his, his power, his, his rod and staff what brought me comfort. I discovered he met my every need. I discovered I didn't have to be fearful. And now I've discovered this wonderful, gracious relationship with my God. And, and I think that's, that's, that's the point I want to make for you guys. Hopefully you can read this one too. It says this. This is the great gift of walking faithfully by trusting in our God through the death dark valley. We're swept up in the loving arms of our good shepherd. We're overwhelmed by his extraordinary goodness, his love, grace, healing, and power. That's the promise. That's the, that's the blessing of the, of the God of the valley and the valley of deep shadow. Where that, that God has walked with us through that. The death dark valley is the place we face ourselves, we face fear, we face death, we face the unknown, we face uncertainty, and it's at that place, not only facing ourselves, we're faced with, will I have faith in my Lord who is my shepherd, who says, I'll meet your every need, and you have no wants. So, how do we emerge on the other side of the death valley of deep shadow? It's just deciding, I will believe I left nothing in Jesus. It's saying, I will trust my good shepherd to provide exactly what I need, exactly when I need it. 
And I'm going to walk like he's with me with his rod and staff, comforting me, encouraging me, guiding me, directing me, and helping me find the, the wounds in my own life that need healing. So I'm not going to fear any evil. And I believe, I really believe, he'll bring life to me through his goodness, his grace, his loving kindness on the other side of the valley of deep shadow. What a blessing it is. So I hope this helps you grow closer to God and makes the 23rd Psalm more special to you. And I encourage you, I really do, if you're going through a death-dark valley, pull that psalm out. Read it every day. Read it two or three times a day. So it really becomes part of your heart. And you realize, I am really blessed by my Father in Heaven. Lord Jesus, I pray you'll bless those who are listening. I pray, Lord, that, that this psalm will be not only special to them because of ways you spoke to them in the past, but may it be special to them now, Lord. Because they're walking through the death dark valley to so they need to fear no evil because you are with them. Watch over them, Father, and bless them and hold them close to you. Ask it all in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Be blessed.